like the uh, elders who have gone before me, I will start with uh, a few words of uh, uh, introduction to my own background. I'm originally from uh, Sue Slesby, so that's south of the border, then moved to Copenhagen where I stud uh, studied chemistry and philosophy. I also had a stint at the Free University in Berlin studying philosophy. From there, I moved to um, uh, the Carlsberg Laboratory as a master's uh, student together with uh, Morten Meldal, and I also did my PhD there. I then did uh, four years of postdoc in Minneapolis uh, in the US and started my independent career at DTU before I then moved to uh, Frexberg campus uh, where I've been since uh, 2001. There are some connections here and if you look at uh, these two uh, uh, pictures here, this is a church in, uh, in Husum near my hometown. And this is uh, Wofru Kirke here in Copenhagen, actually opposite the uh, main office of our university. Um, and these uh, churches are, were designed by the same architect, uh, C.F. Hansen, very famous Danish neoclassicist architect. Now, I'm interested in architecture, but not so much neoclassicistic. I'm more interested in nanoscale architecture, which I will return to later. I just want to briefly um, introduce and acknowledge my co-workers at Volksberg Campus. Um, uh, Mikkel and Casper have been working with me for, um, for a long time. Uh, Nils uh, has also been in my group for quite some time. Unfortunately, I ran out of uh, funding to support him. Uh, uh, but I hope he will be able to return. Uh, there are two uh, postdocs, uh, Narendra and Ebbe, both paid by my, um, uh, my colleagues, actually. And Naya has just transitioned from being a PhD student to being a postdoc in my group. Uh, Liang has submitted his thesis and uh, will be a postdoc too. Josefina has submitted her thesis. And uh, Matcha will still be in the group for some time. And as you can see down here, the sun is shining at uh, Volksberg campus. Good. So the re research we do uh, can be described by the word uh, maybe nanobioorganic chemistry. Um, so we are at the intersection between synthetic bioorganic chemistry, biology, biophysics, medicinal chemistry, and uh, nanoscience. Um, so you could also say that we combine the power of synthetic chemistry uh, with nanoscale methods. Uh, with the aim of understanding biology and develop new medicinal chemistry. So it's a fairly interdisciplinary uh, uh, spot. Um, so the approaches and questions uh, we take are uh, related to um, new chemical methods. So we develop con uh, new methods for peptide synthesis, for regional selective chemistry and proteins, as well as um, uh, new chemistry for carbohydrates. Um, we have a strong interest in peptide medicinal chemistry with a focus on peptide hormones, oral delivery, some aspects of cancer biology, and then uh, insulin. Um, and we have a strong interest in nanoscale phenomena uh, that is creating uh, self-assembly systems, but also uh, using uh, nanoscale methods in, uh, in combination with synthetic chemistry. This is an ongoing strong col uh, collaboration with uh, Nikos Hatsakis. Um, good, so I'll just uh, start with a few words of it, uh, about our chemoselective chemistry, uh, because that will play a role later as well. Uh, so for example, we work with the chemoselective chemistry on, on complex carbohydrates, uh, in particular to understand plant microbe interactions. This may sound a bit esoteric, but it's actually uh, really crucial for developing a more sustainable agriculture. And we develop new methods for uh, protein chemistry. So uh, to be able to do highly selective uh, protein group free chemistry on proteins uh, with the aim of uh, supporting chemical biology as well as development of biopharmaceuticals. <coughs> so to do the uh, chemoselective carbohydrate chemistry, uh, in particular, Miguel in my group has been working with uh, the catalyzed formation of aldose oxymes. So that's the conversion of unprotected carbohydrates down to carbohydrate oxymes down here. 
uh, where we've shown that this reaction can be catalyzed by uh, anilines um, uh, to really uh, promote the formations of these uh, uh, carbohydroxemes. And we've published this as a protocol in Nature Protocols a few years ago. This and similar methods have allowed us to create uh, complex molecules like this. We started out isolating uh, this complex carbohydrate here and then doing a three-step uh, chemical synthesis uh, on it or, uh, and on similar compounds. Um, this plays a role in the communication between uh, plants, some plant cells and uh, uh, rhizobia. Um, the rhizobia synthesize, uh, synthesizes not factors that indicate which rhizobia it is. And this is then being perceived by uh, NFR. So these are a group of receptors and that can lead to the internalization of this uh, into the plant cell and then to nitrogen fixation. Um, we've discovered that this process is more complex um, um, and that they also, that also exopolysaccharides are perceived. This was the topic of uh, a nature paper in 2015 and this year was part of our science paper in uh, 2020. Um, then we developed uh, what we call the HISTAG isolation. This is a modified uh, HISTAG. So this is a polyhistidine sequence placed primarily at the end terminal part of a protein where we put a glycine on front of it so that we get this here, a glycine sequence, a, his, a glycine and then a HIST sequence and then using uh, tuned reagents, we're able to selectively isolate this amino group out here and to create a covalent conjugate. So this is then a um, highly selective way to introduce biotin moieties, fluorophores, acetyl groups, and so on, on proteins. Uh, it occurs at neutral pH and aqueous buffer. Um, good. So the main part today will be about uh, insulin fractals and medicinal chemistry. So I'll start a little bit with insulin background, a few things about insulin chemistry, and then I move on to talk about uh, terpudine insulin and glucose responsive insulin. Um, so some of the key questions here for us are uh, whether we can control the self-assembly of biomolecules and can we build new architectures and new architectures that would not just be the overall shape, but we would also be able to control if you will, the internal part. Um, that is one line. The other line is responsiveness. Can we use signals to control nanoscale self-assembly? And can we develop signals that will allow uh, us to have responsive biopharmaceuticals? Or to say in other words, can we use uh, physiological signals to have responsive biopharmaceuticals? Just a few uh, words as a reminder on diabetes. Um, more than 45 million people worldwide have been diagnosed with uh, type one diabetes. Unfortunately, there are probably uh, a lot more. Uh, they do require insulin on a daily basis. And typically they would re receive uh, a combination of insulins, a short acting and a long acting. Um, and these insulins all work in the same way in the sense that uh, they always lower uh, the blood glucose. The difference between short and long acting is just how they do it. Um, it would be highly desired, desirable to have a glucose responsive insulin. Um, so insulin um, is a fascinating molecule. Here I show uh, human insulin, 51 amino acid, three disulfide bridges. Um, it's an evolutionarily old uh, protein, um, about uh, 500 million years old, uh, from an evolutionary point of view. It has uh, three amino groups, uh, one, one there, and uh, one over here. And then um, different animals have uh, different insulins. Um, good. So just a few uh, things about um, insulin. It's, uh, it's highly uh, active. Uh, it's active at picomolar concentrations. It can dimerize. Uh, so two carbons can go together and form a dimer, a non-covalent dimer. And this can then further uh, hexamerize, that is forming a hexamer, 
around two zinc ions. This can further be aided by uh, phenols and calcium. So inherently, insulin by itself has some interesting uh, self-assembly properties. And as you're probably all aware, um, a number of uh, very successful insulin variants have been developed uh, that are more suitable for, um, for being injected. Um, and some of the most successful ones have been developed in Denmark uh, by my colleagues at uh, Novo Nordisk, um, uh, including Thomas Rue Jensen, who uh, co-developed uh, insulin Diclodec. Um, good. So we've been focusing on uh, organic chemistry on insulin, and we have recently re reviewed the chemistry on, uh, on insulin uh, in this review on the ABC of insulin uh, with Master Estagor and uh, Narendra uh, Kumar Mishra. And uh, it shows how, you, uh, how the uh, self-assembly occurs from the dimer to the hexamer, how you can make multi-hexamers how you can do acylations, reductive aminations, and so on. Good. So in the, the first project that I want to present here, uh, we synthesized uh, terpyridine uh, insulin. Um, so as mentioned, insulin has three amino groups. They have different pKa values. And at pH uh, 10.5, uh, we can, with a relatively good uh, selectivity, isolate the uh, license B29 uh, um, down here. And uh, then after purification step, we get this uh, license B29 terpy uh, human insulin here. The terpyridine here is of course a metal ion binding ligand. Um, it has a good affinity for ion two, but can also co coordinate um, uh, europium. And uh, we get optical properties uh, when we do that. Um, and uh, the optical properties uh, depend on the, uh, uh, on the metal ion that we use. Um, of course, uh, working with lanternites, uh, uh, we can get uh, uh, luminescence. So the idea here is to use the coordination with metal ion to create a different structures in terms of overall shape, but also in terms of internal organization. Um, so after Narendra synthesized this uh, together with um, Mr. Ustagor and, uh, and a lot of other people, um, we started, uh, they started analyzing uh, the self-assembly of this terpyridine in the presence of different metal ions and different ratios of them. Uh, we used, uh, in the process towards this, uh, uh, we used uh, DLS and size exclusion chromatography. But in the end, to understand the, the structure, we relied on small angle X-ray sc scattering. Uh, this is a really high power technique using an, an X-ray uh, source from a synchrotron. It goes through a monochromator and it, have, it hits the sample. And then you get uh, this, um, uh, the pattern out here. So it's not like a diffraction in a crystal. Yeah, you get this uh, pattern out here, which is then being analyzed. And you get uh, data like this. So on the left side here, you have the sex intensities. So for example, for this one here, this is just the terpy insulin without a uh, metal ion. Here, uh, Narendra added different uh, ratios of um, um, of metal ion. And here I would like you to remind you that insulin can hexamerize. So that is why we have uh, these uh, ratios here. And what you clearly can see here is that there's an effect from the ratio of the metal ion. So we have already here, we can say we have a directing effect from the metal ion concentration. Uh, down here, it's shown for uh, a different metal ion, it's for ion two. You can also see that uh, these curves look rather different. Uh, so not only can we control the self-assembly by the ratio of the metal ion, but also the nature of the metal ion. Um, unless you're a SAC specialist, and I'm not really a SAC specialist, um, these curves um, need to be translated into something else to better understand the information that is in, in them. And for that, you have um, figures like this, which are pair distance distributions. Um, that can also give you a molecular weight uh, estimation. 
so here we can already directly see that with metal, uh, with the iron two, uh, we get self assemblies uh, that are a bit small. They are responsive to uh, the uh, ratio of metal ions uh, added, and, and that's what we were hoping for. So that's good. Uh, with the europium, we get uh, larger self assemblies. Uh, over here on the right side, um, uh, Nils performed modeling of the uh, of the data, and he was able to he was able was able to extract the fractal dimensionality of these structures. Fractal dimensionality. I will return to it in a moment. Down here, um, this is for the iron. Um, he used empty simulation uh, to uh, estimate which uh, self assemble structure here would best fit these smaller structures that we create with iron. And he was able to see that it's actually a ditetramere of uh, insulin. So a ditetramere, it was called an octamere, uh, but I will show in a moment why we call it a, a ditetramere. Um, good, so this is here from the, uh, the, the back cover of uh, our publication in, in nanoscale. Uh, this is mainly uh, Nils's illustration. So you have the fractal pattern down here. Here you have the Sachs curve with the iron two. Um, it forms smaller structures, uh, whereas with europium um, that has different coordination properties, uh, we get the larger structures and by the, uh, uh, we get increased fractal dimensionality and by the ratio of uh, europium, we can actually tune this. But what does that mean, fractal dimensionality? Here, um, uh, Nils created um, a ball model. Uh, so you can see that with increasing fractal dimensionality, the structure becomes more uh, complex. Um, so in, in Euclidean uh, dimensions, uh, you have um, straight lines like this here. In fractal dimensions, uh, you have more um, convoluted uh, complex and also um, self-similar structures. You may be uh, remember this from uh, what you read about uh, Mandelbrot um, geometries and the coast of England and how uh, the coast of England can be seen as a self-similar uh, structure. That is, once you uh, start up, um, your large scale structure is also found in your smaller scale structure. So fractal dimension can be seen as a, as a measure of how complicated uh, a structure is. Now at the last uh, chem talk, um, uh, Torsten Hansen set a precedence for using vegetables to illustrate science. And here we have uh, broccoli uh, with a fractal like appearance uh, where the larger scale structure is similar to the smaller scale structure. So um, to understand the fractal, dimensionality uh, in self-assembled insulin is potentially very important um, because it might be, a, a, might be a factor that is important for how insulin works when it has been injected subcutaneously uh, into a depot. So the property of that depot might be controlled uh, by uh, the fractal dimensionality of the insulin that is there. This is actually, we have some preliminary data on that um, uh, but we have just complete, completed a major study together with colleagues uh, in Vancouver and uh, where we studied this uh, in vivo. And, but I cannot show that data yet, uh, but we are trans working on translating this into um, uh, a medicinal chemistry um, perspective. Good, Nils went on um, with empty simulations. Um, so this here is the uh, putative uh, uh, ditetramere here. Um, and he also did uh, empty simulations to understand how the interactions around uh, the metal line could be. Uh, terpyridine can bind, uh, uh, can have a bind in a C3 symmetric uh, manner uh, together with water. And to understand the role of water in this process here, uh, we collaborated with uh, Mr. Lantonite, uh, Thomas Hughes Sørensen, and uh, we can with confidence say that besides terpyridine, it also binds uh, to molecules of water. Here. 
but I will now go on to the last part, uh, which is glucose responsive insulin. So now we are moving from nanoscale architecture and responsiveness to um, metal ions to uh, responsiveness to a physiological signal. And that is towards the development of a smart insulin. Uh, this is actually um, a term not invented by me, but a term found in literature for insulin that is more active when needed and less active when not needed. So when the blood glucose is high and needs to be lower, the insulin should be more active. And when the blood glucose does not need to be lead, uh, lowered, it should uh, not be active. Um, this would be a highly desirable property of uh, insulin. Uh, that's why it has been pursued uh, for decades. It's uh, very difficult to achieve. Um, but many um, people living with type one diabetes have episodes where they have low blood glucose uh, because they've injected too much uh, insulin um, compared to the nutrition they've taken or the physical exercise they have, uh, have performed. Uh, but such a smart insulin should be responsive uh, to the glucose concentration. Our approach to this is to have a cleavable linker. So that is to have insulin, something that helps it forms a depot and then bind to albumin and then a cleavable linker so that when the glucose concentration goes up, this linkage is cleaved and active insulin is being released. Here it's then shown for uh, a rodent model. So um, we would inject our uh, glucose responsive insulin in a rodent. Uh, it would be released into circulation and in circulation, it would bind uh, to the most abandoned protein that we have in circulation, which is in blood circulation, which is albumin. And from there, uh, it would be just sitting, waiting uh, to be released when uh, blood glucose concentration goes up. Um, this was a really long story. Um, and you will see later how many people it involved. Uh, but these are the type of structures we had. So, uh, insulin here, modification of the lysine B29. Um, um, and then we uh, synthesized hydrosones and thiazolidines. Um, hydrosones are, uh, are well known to be cleavable. It's less uh, established for thiazolidines, but we had previous experience with thiazolidines from uh, carbohydrates. So we have previously synthesized carbohydrate thiazolidines. Um, um, so that is also why I started out mentioning how our chemoselective chemistry on carbohydrates actually plays a role uh, in the development of uh, glucose responsive insulin. We did a lot of studies and I'm only gonna summarize it briefly here. Um, so we started out looking, I'll go briefly back uh, at core structures like these. And uh, we then looked at, um, at higher glucose concentrations, do they cleave faster than at lower glucose concentration? And we were for a sufficient number of them able to see that at higher glucose concentration, they cleave faster than at lower. So that is then glucose responsiveness on the core structure level. Uh, we then synthesized uh, um, model compounds where we anchored these to insulin, and also there uh, we saw uh, that at higher glucose concentration, uh, they cleaved faster. And in the final study, uh, um, we um, um, performed an, a CLAM study. That is, my colleagues at uh, the biotech comp company Gubra performed a CLAM study, and let's just show it here. So, in a CLAM study, um, you infuse um, glucose into uh, an animal or a human. I mean, this is not a, a very invasive procedure. Um, and then uh, you look at, um, you expose the, the animal or the human um, to different um, uh, insulins and you see uh, whether you need to infuse more uh, more or less uh, glucose. And here, this is to have the uh, normal, normal glycemia. Um, so here we have the different uh, 
insulin variants. We had some controls over here, and then we had our uh, uh, glucose responsive insulin over here. Um, so here you can see that, um, and it's a long story, um, that at um, when you have set a high glucose concentration, so you infuse glucose into the animal or the human, here it was an animal, um, to have a high glucose level, uh, level then uh, to maintain that, you needed to have a higher infusion rate when, you had, when uh, we uh, injected our glucose responsive insulin, which means uh, that at higher glucose concentration, it becomes more active. Good. So, um, so we, we have proven at the small molecule level, at the conjugate level, but also in vivo, that we have a glucose responsiveness. There was no real roadmap to show this, uh, but I think we can say that, uh, that we have done that. Um, you know, we are confident that we have done that. Uh, and this has resonated very, um, very well in the, in the media. Um, and for example, in Daily Mail, uh, we were highlighted. Um, I don't know what you think about Daily Mail, but writing uh, this, uh, working with Daily Mail uh, was actually a rather professional experience. Uh, and there was a professional science um, writer uh, writing about this. Um, good. So finally, I would like to acknowledge uh, the many people who have contributed uh, to this. So uh, for the Turkey, it has been uh, uh, Narendra, uh, Liang, uh, Mas, uh, Søren, uh, my longtime collaborator for SAX, Lisa Litt, who's now uh, our, um, our protocan for science, uh, Stefan, who was a guest student, uh, Nils, who really uh, did the empty simulations and the SAX analysis, and is also a co-corresponding author together with Peter here. Then our collaborators at uh, Søren, and at our department here. And down here, uh, you see some of those many who have contributed to other aspects that are mentioned uh, of this here. The funding for uh, our work uh, comes from a new Nordisk Foundation Challenge Grant. Uh, the main PI is Hanne Mark Nielsen, as well as a grant from the Willem Foundation. Uh, um, and uh, along the way also the company uh, Gupra and the uh, Swedish company Biotech, uh, Biotouch, sorry. And I, I enjoy a number of collaborations uh, with Gupra, uh, with SDU, uh, with Jens Sogor, we've worked uh, for the last 15 years uh, on uh, the complex, sig uh, complex carbohydrate signal molecules. Um, I've initiated a strong collaboration with Nikos and continue the collaboration with Sanne and Peter and so on. And with Helena, we have started a collaboration. I started collaborating with her on cone snail insulins. So for the glucose responsive insulin, this was a large complex molecule, um, <laughs> complex pro uh, project driven by, um, uh, together with uh, Gubra, the biotech company in Herson, was uh, largely funded by JDRF, which is the, uh, largest nonprofit organization that supports research in type one diabetes. And we had the help from uh, Red Lead in Sweden. And uh, finally, uh, I would like to thank all my coworkers, also those I have not mentioned here. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention.